Everyone is looking for answers. Answers to both the common and the complicated matters of life. Thankfully, the real answers to all of life's questions are found in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the key that unlocks these answers, providing real solutions for this life and the life to come. As you join us today, you'll discover real answers to life's most pressing questions. And you, along with us, can rejoice in the Lord. I was in fifth grade. I was attending Lincoln Elementary School in Adrian, Michigan, and it was my second year on the fourth and fifth grade basketball team. So I was somewhat of a veteran on the team, fifth grade, playing basketball. And we actually did play other schools. Um, we were, you know, in a league in our, in our little town, and, and um, we're playing another team. I don't remember who the other school was that we were playing, but I do remember very vividly it was a home game. And so in our little gym at Lincoln Elementary School, the, uh, the, the stage area was always set up with chairs, and parents and fans would would pack into that area, and that's where they would, would watch the game. And the first half had come and gone, and again, I don't remember so many of the details, except I remember this event vividly. It was just after halftime, and there was a jump ball, and I got the ball, and I had it like a break away, nobody on me layup. And I'm taking off, and I can remember, literally, I can remember the roar of the crowd. Now, here I am in fifth grade, and this is a, this is a big deal for a fifth grader. I mean, I'm taking off, I'm dribbling the ball, and I, I know I'm flying. It probably looks really great on slow-mo, you know, and, and I'm going, and I'm all by myself. And the crowd is, it must have been a close score. Because I can hear the, the, the shouting of the crowd. And, of course, it's mostly a home crowd. And I'm going, and I shoot the ball, a layup, and I missed the layup. And I remember that the crowd cheered because I was shooting at the wrong basket. Okay. <laughs> and I remember, you know, somebody, one of my teammates got me, and he says, Jeff, it's the wrong basket. I'm like, I know, you know. <laughs> at that moment, I remember looking over at the, uh, the place where all the people were. And there's a lot of people shaking their head, you know. My coach's face, Coach Allen, I remember him really well. My coach's face was beet red. I mean, and it was not like an embarrassed red. It was a hot red, all right. And I can remember looking at my dad. And my dad had this look on his face like, whose kid is that, you know. <laughs> But the thing that stood out was the, the, the intensity of the crowd. I mean, they, they, were, they were yelling, I thought, cheering. But the crowd was intense. In the next two chapters in the book of Galatians, Galatians 3 and 4, there are 60 verses. Some have said that there is no place in Scripture where the Apostle Paul is more direct where in a sense his voice can be heard any louder than in these 60 verses. And in fact, from the moment you begin in verse number 1 of chapter 3, you see language that the Apostle Paul uses in speaking to people that he clearly loves, and you think, wow, this is intense. Why the intensity packed into these 60 verses in the, the middle of the book of Galatians? I think the answer is because in very real terms, far more consequential than a, than a fifth grader on a breakaway layup at the wrong basket, because the church at Galatia now had been so swirled and twirled around that they're going in the opposite direction to the direction that will lead to their good. They're, in a sense, they're, they're, they're playing for the wrong team. They're going to end up at the wrong goal. 
They're, they're going in a direction that will produce for them absolutely no good. And so it's as if the Apostle Paul, with pen in hand, is making a statement to the church that says, turn around now. Sometimes we misconstrue the urgency of someone who clearly loves us. And we misconstrue it as to say, well, well, you must not care about me that much, or, or you wouldn't speak to me in those terms. Or why are you so direct with me? Why do you say such hurtful things? There's no hurt intended at all. In fact, just the opposite. The urgency from, from those who oftentimes seem to be, wow, uh, uh, unhinged. The urgency is exactly what we see with the Apostle Paul, and that is it is a call to turn around. The, the urgency and the directness is not because they don't love you. It's, it's exactly the opposite. It's because they do. Look at how the Apostle Paul begins this address to the church at Galatia. Look at verse number one. The first thing we're going to see this morning is what Paul, in a sense, addresses as an evil eye. An evil eye. Look at verse number one. Here the apostle says this. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Remember now, the Judaizers were working to take the believers in Galatia and return them from the purity of salvation by grace alone to salvation by grace and works, which can never be mixed together. So Paul says, in no uncertain terms, O oh foolish Galatians, in a sense, he's saying it like this. He's saying, are you idiotic? You say, well, that's, that's kind of abrupt. It is abrupt. But the consequences, if he doesn't arrest their attention, is severe. So he says, oh, oh foolish Galatians, what are you doing? Who hath bewitched you that you would forsake that which you yourself have been convinced of, and now you're pursuing Another gospel? Remember, you cannot mix grace and works. They, they are the oil and water of Scripture. They do not mix together. Paul said it very clearly in another passage of Scripture. Let, let me read it for us this morning. Listen to how it was worded, how it's put together, presented in ways that we say, oh, okay, yeah. So if, if, if grace means this, and it only means that, then it can never mean this. And if works actually means this, if I have my definition correct, then works can never mean, listen to how he words it. He says in Romans chapter 11, verse number six, and if by grace, that is, if salvation comes by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Did you get what he just said? He said, okay, if grace is what it is, then salvation can only come by grace, not by works. Otherwise, grace is really not grace. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Do you, do you see he's saying it has to be exclusively one or the other. You can't say, well, maybe it's kind of like a, a, a grace works salvation. He says, no, no, no. Otherwise, grace is not grace. So don't say that, well, salvation is kind of grace, but then there's some works. He says, no, because those two can never be mixed together. So Paul begins with a jolting adjective, and then he asks an important question. So first, the, the interesting adjective is foolish. What Paul's not saying by that is Paul is not saying that the Galatians were lacking in mental ability, but they were lacking in spiritual discernment. It's not that they couldn't figure this out. At this point, they were just not being discerning. It's as if he is, is saying something like this. Have you ever had someone say to you, use this expression, have you lost your mind? And then he asks an important question. It's a little strange to us, but when we start to understand the culture, the expression, 
It's one of those like, oh, okay, I get what he's saying. He says this, he says, who hath bewitched you? It's the only time in the entire Bible that this word's used. It's, it's found no place else in scripture. And Paul inserts it here under the very direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's as if the Holy Spirit said, hey, Paul, you've never used this word before. You're never going to use it again, but I want to get their attention. So the Holy Spirit says, insert this word here. And Paul says, who hath bewitched you? It carries the idea of casting a spell upon someone or hypnotizing them. Okay, do you remember, like maybe when you're a kid, you would try to play some game with someone else and you would look at them and you'd say, look into my eyes. Okay, that's, that's the idea that, that is, is brought up in the mind. Look into my eyes. When I say this, you're going to, okay, now, is Paul saying that some mystical thing has happened to the church at Galatia? Actually, no. But, well, what is he saying? Spurgeon said it this way. Spurgeon said, in Paul's day, it was believed that men could cast an evil eye upon another and thus work evil upon their fellow men. The very thing that had once been presented with such clarity, viewed by them with such fondness, was now being looked upon with suspicion. Paul, attempting to jar them back into reality, says it's as if someone has cast a spell on you. They had become intrigued by this mixing of law and grace. Let's go back to some things that we used to be involved in. Hey, we can incorporate those things into our worship and by it, we can have some merit of our own. Pause for a moment and, and let's at least explore a couple of, of ideas or the question of how could this happen to them? Why would they want to go back to works and grace? Well, what could not only take someone away from the gospel, but actually cause an evil eye toward the same? The first thing I, I thought of or jotted down was fear. Why would they go back to something that was old in abandonment of what God had presented as clearly his way? Fear. The Judaizers were fearing the loss of control. Others may have been in fear of uncertainty. The law was rigid, stable, known. But grace seemed dynamic. There's a relational aspect to grace. This was scary new territory, and there was naturally some fear involved. Think about what they are abandoning and what they are now embracing. To say that the rites, the covenants, the days, all of these things, they're, they're no more there, it's a fearful thing. So why is it that, that going back to might have some appeal? Well, fear. Why else? Change. This was different. The traditions of Judaism had been clearly established. The special feasts, the sacrifices, the observance of days, the rites of passage, all this had been so deeply ingrained into the life of the Jews. Clearly, there were patterns that had been followed for so long, for them to fall back into them would provide some comfortable familiarity. Do you know, this idea of going back to something that is known in abandonment of something that is not fully known, it appeals to us. Why would they start to look with some big question mark over that which Paul had presented? Well, this is, this is really different. God oftentimes does bring change into our lives to get our attention and focus our eyes back on him. Well, why would they have not wanted this? Well, this is change. There, there's something reassuring about old. It's like an old chair that seems to surround you with comfort when you sit in it. It's familiar. A pair of shoes that seem to almost hug your feet when you slip into them. They knew the law. Its familiarity seemed beckoning to them. And by the way, just as a, a short aside, this is also one of the challenges with breaking patterns of sin. Haven't you ever found yourself... I don't know, strangely attracted to that which you are familiar with. A pattern, 
a habit, something that you are trying to bring yourself out of. It's like that, it's like that rut in the road that the tire starts to catch and before you know it, the tire is in it and, and, and it just wants to hold and hang on to that tire as long as it can and it takes some effort now to bring that tire back up out of the deep rut. So sin, that which we're familiar with, that which we said, oh, I can navigate this. It's known to me, this pattern of life, this way I've established. Listen, I, I, I've got all the supporting uh, accoutrements of that way of life. So at times, it's challenging for us to, to come out of that because it is what we're familiar with. And, and oftentimes, we just don't like change. What else caused the, the Galatians to look at the Apostle Paul and the truths of the gospel with this evil eye? Hmm, eyebrow raised, now a little suspicious of that which they once embraced. Distortion. Distortion. Someone misrepresented the gospel. Hey, that may have happened to you at some point. Someone may have taken the purity, the simplicity of the gospel and the way of Jesus Christ and perverted it. They changed it into something that in Scripture it truly is not. Most cults take truths, the truths of Scripture, they begin to distort them to say that which they really don't say at all. And by the way, a lie is a lie no matter who says it, no matter how often it is repeated, and no matter how they try to support it with Scripture. If it's a lie, it's a lie. So why do they look at it with an evil eye? Fear, change, distortion, this one is, is what it is, but I think there is something to be said about their emotions, about their emotions. There's something appealing to us, something that we like when religion offers us something that we can do. There's something that we just like about it. Like, okay, what can I do? Uh, what, what can I be involved in? How can I have a part of this? It gives us some sense of, of a, appealing to our pride. Like, hey, I had a part in that. I'm the one who got to. I finally achieved this. So emotion. Christians, by the way, who live their lives pursuing feeling at the expense of truth will eventually look at truth with an evil eye when it infringes upon what they want to feel. Like I'm so connected to what I want to feel about my faith that I'll look at truth now with suspicion. Because I want to feel something. And now I'll start to shape my doctrine around my feelings as opposed to letting my feelings do whatever they want, but getting my head wrapped around truth, around doctrine. We open ourselves then to sometimes even the slightest breeze of fallacy and are carried away. Ephesians 4.14 addresses this quite directly. Here it says that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Okay, he says, don't be children. Hey, what are children ruled by? They're known by being controlled by emotions. And you know what a Christian is controlled by when he says, hey, this is what I want to feel is, is what Paul says, listen, you're just a child, you're driven by emotion, and now you're tossed about by every little new wind of doctrine. Children are driven by emotion. Don't use as well, I don't know exactly what that says, I just know what I believe. No, 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 let's know what we believe and why we believe it and from whence that belief came. Okay, so the first thing that we see here is we see this evil eye. Look at what Paul goes on to say. He now says, have you had nothing but an empty experience? Look at verse number two. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain. Okay, so to help us understand what the apostle is saying here, let's just um, switch gears for a moment, and, and I think we'll see the connection. So in the beginning, God created. Okay, he created the heavens and the earth. He did so by the word of his power. He just spoke, and, and it came into existence. 
what God began to do then was God began to put in process something that we call life coming from life. Life is only that which can produce life. There has never been in the history of science the observation of spontaneous generation. That is, in the history of science, in the history of mankind, there's never been an example where something living came naturally from that which was not living. In other words, the only way that life is produced is from life. We actually have observed this so much that we call it the life or the the law of biogenesis. The law of biogenesis. It has to happen this way. Now, evolutionary science is hoping for a future day when they'll be able to say that, aha, aha, now we have observed life coming from non-life, but it just doesn't happen. It's the way God created. The same principle holds true in the spiritual world as it does in the natural world. In the natural world, it takes life to create life. In the spiritual world, Paul asks a question. Were you brought to spiritual life by that which can never produce life? Were you brought to spiritual life by the keeping of the law? Or were you brought to spiritual life by the supernatural working of the Spirit of God? And there can be only one correct answer. Look again at your Bible. The word suffered down at verse number two. He said, received ye the spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith. Verse three, are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? The word suffered there, it's the Greek word pasco. Pasco. Here's what it means. It means to be affected by something, to feel, to have a real experience. Essentially, Paul's saying it like this. After experiencing the reality of all that Christ has done for you, after you have seen for yourself him giving you life, working in your life, in the lives of others, have you concluded that it was all for nothing or that it came by another means? We have to ask the same questions today. How many of you have seen God do a work of God-like proportion in your life? Did he save you by grace? Did he save you through faith? Then what makes us think that we must be saved by grace, but maintained by works? Please note, I am not saying that our works don't matter. And I'm going to say that again. I I hope your, your brain is connected. I want us to know, do works matter? And the answer is yes, they do. I am not saying, hey, just throw works completely out. Oh, I am saying throw works completely out of your salvation and the maintenance of the same. But do works matter? Well, of course they do. Our works matter because they evidence the reality of our faith. They're the means by which we will be rewarded. They're done in obedience to our Lord. They serve to advance the name of Jesus Christ, but they have absolutely nothing to do with the attaining or maintaining of our salvation. Later in this very book, Paul's gonna say it this way. Galatians 6, 4, Paul says, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Jesus said it very plainly in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Are works important? Yes, but only in their rightful place. So Paul's asking the question, were you saved by grace or by works? Did life actually come from something that has never produced life before? Or is your experience something completely unique? Were you never truly saved at all? These are the questions that the Apostle Paul is asking. Essentially, he's saying this, you haven't had an empty experience. You began your journey with Jesus Christ by faith and the power of his spirit. So let's leave it there. This brings us to our final thought in this passage, and it is an earnest exhortation. Look with me in the word, if you will, down at verse number five. Verse number five. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law 
or by the hearing of faith. What now takes place is Paul is exhorting the Galatians to think. He's saying, don't be gullible. Don't be mentally lazy. He, don't be foolish. Don't be seduced. Don't be cast under the same silly fascination with the old law. Instead, engage your thinking. Here's what we might say today. Ask hard questions and be prepared for honest answers. The cost of the Galatians allowing others to do their thinking for them was very high. I'm just going to submit this to all of us today, that there are many who continue to pay the price today for allowing others to do their thinking for them. Should a pastor do your thinking for you? No, a pastor should prepare a really uh, appetizing meal, and he should take pains to do so. He, he should put together truth and study line upon line, precept upon precept, but is he supposed to do your thinking for you? Wouldn't it be wise for any person to take any Bible message and weigh that Bible message against the truths of Scripture? The Bereans in Scripture were actually commended because they searched the Scriptures to see whether those things that even the apostles themselves had preached were true. So Paul's saying, okay, just start asking some important questions. The cost of them allowing others to do their thinking, very high Instead, Paul's just saying, think, ask questions. He's trying to force them to reconcile some things in their head. Then he's going to lay out some irrefutable, irrefutable arguments that if they will think about it, they're going to arrive at some correct conclusions. In like fashion, you and I must be prepared both to ask and answer hard questions. Hey, listen, for all of us today... If you've already drawn conclusions and aren't willing to ask questions, you also put yourself in a precarious situation. Is God, is God afraid of questions? Hey, how many of you have ever been a little, a little taken back when someone asks you a question? Maybe even a little bothered. Have you ever gotten a little like, well, who are you to ask me? That question. For example, uh, 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 I don't know, maybe you're encouraging your children to have their devotions, spend time in the Word. Now, you need to read the Bible every day. Daddy, did you read the Bible today? Th that's not really the point. You need to. Okay, do you understand questions are those that, that actually expose us? Are you available to have your faith question. You'd say, well, well, no, because I believe it. Oh, I know you believe it. That's wonderful. But isn't it okay to say, okay, if I ask this question, am I going to be afraid of the answer? Listen, there's nothing to be afraid of in here. There's nothing to be afraid of. You can go ahead and ask the questions. And you know what you're going to do? If you'll ask honest questions, you're going to come up with honest answers. Don't be afraid of questions. That they can be found within the pages of this book. You say, well, well, I was always taught that. Great. Take that teaching and say, now, where did that come from? Do you know what you're going to typically find? I think more often than not, you're going to say, hey, I, I see now why I was taught that. I get it. Now, now I own that for myself. It's not just that, well, that's the way I've always been taught. Now it's, hey. That's the way I've always been taught, and it resonates with the truths of Scripture. If we're not willing to ask those questions, how solid truly is your faith? There are questions that pertain to doctrine, to culture, to lifestyle, to entertainment, to education, to family, to government, to worship. I mean, you can go on and on. There's a lot of questions, and does the Bible offer answers to those questions? Isn't it wonderful that it does? At times, when the church has been given difficult questions, we've answered with a simple, well, just trust God. While there may be times when I must just trust God because I don't have all the answers, I must not use just trust God as my excuse to simply, you know, go on because I don't want to answer. Do we have to just trust God? Surely there are times when God, I, I don't understand. Abraham is a great example. He went out not knowing. 
But let me tell you, he didn't go out ignorantly. While he didn't know where he was going, he clearly knew the one he was going with. Listen, church, today it's okay to ask honest questions, and it's something that the Galatians didn't. And it got them heading in a direction that they shouldn't have been going in. Paul encourages the church at Galatia to ask. Let's not be afraid of the questions, but rather earnestly invite them. Answers can be found, and Paul was loaded with them, ready to provide them for a people who needed to be asked some serious questions themselves. So what is the question that's being asked? It's this. Did God supply your need by the works of the law or by the acceptance of faith? Do you remember when Jesus was in a crowded house? He, he's teaching and preaching, and the house is so full that you couldn't get in. But there were four friends who needed to get a man to Jesus who was crippled. They began to peel off the, 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 the tiles of the roof. They lower their friend down. People are backing up because there's a man coming down. Do you remember what Jesus said to the man first? He said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then do you remember what the uh, Pharisees were doing? They didn't say anything, but Jesus knew what they were thinking. Who in the world does he think he is? Did I just hear him say what I think he said? Did he he say that that he just forgave sin? Yes, that's what he said. Hmm. And Jesus, knowing what they thought in their heart, he said, um, why reason ye in your heart? When I said Thy sins be forgiven thee. He said, but so that you can know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sin, I say unto you, take up your bed and walk. And he did. And the Pharisees are standing there, scratching their heads, saying, how in the world? We've never seen this before. How was that man made whole? Did Jesus say this to the man? Um, Sir, Keepest thou the law? Hast thou followed all the rites? Uh, Do you observe the days? Are you perfect toward the law? Then take up thy bed and walk. Could the law ever make that man walk whole again? No, but Jesus could. Do you remember the woman who was uh, 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 with an issue of blood year after year after year? She'd spent all and and been none the better. And she just went and she touched the, the hem of his garment Did Jesus stop and say, if thou keepest the law, thou mayest be whole? Or does he turn to her and say, your faith hath made you whole? Do you know how many times that that expression keeps coming back to us over and over and over? For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Mark 5, 34, Jesus told a woman that had been plagued, thy faith hath made thee whole. In Mark 10, 52, Jesus told a blind man that his faith has made him whole. In Luke 17, 19, Jesus said to a leper, thy faith hath made thee whole, and he went away cleansed. None of these found healing in the keeping of the law. That was something the law could simply not provide. It could lead them to the person who can, but no further. Our goodness wasn't enough to bring us to salvation, nor is it enough to secure our salvation. It begins with grace, and it is kept by the same. Paul wants us to remember that the Christian life is a supernatural life. It is explained with the words, the just shall live by faith. May we never have an evil eye towards the truths of Scripture because we have been, through some means, led away. May we not have had an empty experience, something that actually means nothing because it wasn't real. May we receive an earnest exhortation. Let's ask some serious questions and let's come to some honest biblical conclusions. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. 
Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.